Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Chidima Onyebuchi from the WTO Accessions Division. I want to welcome you with great pleasure to the 10th session of the WTO Accessions webinar series. It's WTO Accessions Week, and I trust that the past events which we have had throughout this week have been very valuable knowledge for your accessions processes, for developing your development partner strategies, and also for your market access negotiations. Now, if there is one thing that we have learned throughout this week from the series of webinars that we have had, is that the WTO accession process, it's very elaborate, and it constitutes wide-reaching reforms, which impact a broad range of sectors policies and institutions, which means that it is very crucial to have all stakeholders and all sectors participating in the process, both from the negotiation to after the negotiations, which is called the post accessions. And this is the reason why today we will be shining a light on the private sector, which is a pivotal part of every economy, and getting their voices and their perspectives on how to ensure that both the public sector and the private sector are communicating effectively throughout the negotiation process and also after the negotiation implementing the commitments and also maximizing the benefits which can be gotten from WTO accessions. We will also touch on themes of regional integration, which is one of the most important topics right now in the multilateral trading system and also on reviving the economies post COVID-19. Now, before we move on, I would like to introduce all our distinguished panelists for today's session. I can assure you that they come from diverse disciplines in the private sector, and it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Our first speaker is Mr. Sangay Doji, who is the Secretary General of the Bhutan Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mr. Sangay has long experience in accelerating its sustainable economic development through venture projects and partnerships with both the private sector and governance in Bhutan. Um, we welcome you, Mr. Sangay. Welcome to this session. Next, I would like to invite our I would like to welcome our colleague from the International Trade Center, Mrs. Daria Shabalina, who is a trade policy analyst. She has extensive research and practice experience in WTO trade remedies, regional trade negotiations, competition, and also trade and development issues. Thank you for joining us, Daria. I would also like to introduce Mr. Igor Schmidt, who is the head of government relations, public affairs, and market access for the Eurocan Group. The Eurocan Group is a leading global mineral fertilizer producer. Mr. Schmidt has um, led the work to facilitate the removal of trade barriers for fertilizers and to enhance their access to markets of foreign countries, both when Russia was negotiating and post accessions also. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Igor. And also, I would like to introduce Mr. Anthony Anis Haga, who is the CEO of the Haga Group and also a member of the Sudanese Businessmen Foundation. The Haga Group is a family investment vehicle that has invested severally across Africa in ICT sector, the energy sector, and agriculture. And may I also mention for our audience that the Haga Group has been around for over 100 years. So that's way older than some of us <laughs> here. Um, he has over 20 years of management and transaction experience in Africa, including in issues of asset disposals, mergers and acquisitions, and restructuring company. He's also a founding member of the U.S. Sudan Business Council and European Chamber of Commerce. And finally, I would like to also introduce Mr. Rajesh Agarwal, who is joining us together with our colleague Daria from the ITC, the International Trade Center. He is the chief of the trade facilitation and policy for business team, and he'll be giving us a commentary at the end of this um, session. So welcome everybody, we're glad to have you here. We will go now to the topic of today, and I would like to start with Mr. Sangay Doji. Now, Bhutan is currently one of the countries in the pipeline to join the WTO, and by extension, you know, the larger multilateral trading system. And right now, it is currently discussing the reinitiation of its WTO accession process after having had the fourth working party meeting in, 20, um, in 2008. Now we understand that the Bhutan Chamber of Commerce and Industry is not is not a it's not a stranger to having public private dialogue. So given the pivotal role which the private sector plays 
in Bhutan and generally in the multilateral trading system. What do you think are the benefits and challenges to the private sector for Bhutan when it joins the WTO? Also concerning the challenges, how do you think they can be addressed? Mr. Sange, you have the floor. Mr. Sange, please could you unmute yourself? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you, Ms. Onibuchi. And uh, hello to all the participants, the panelists. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having me uh, on this very uh, interesting uh, topic of this uh, public-private uh, dialogue on accession to WTO. Since there's only eight minutes, I know I understand uh, the question was very clearly asked to me and uh, also about uh, the debate about Bhutan's process of accession towards the WTO has, uh, Ms. Onyebichi has rightly mentioned, the debate has been now going on for almost a decade about whether Bhutan should actually uh, join the WTO or not. And there's been a lot of uh, views, positive as well as negative views, and because of which this debate has been, uh, is still an ongoing debate actually. Now, uh, I thought the eight minutes that has been allotted to me would be, you know, uh, I thought would be, could be best spent if I highlight on some of the views on why this debate is taking such a long time and then uh, talk about the challenges that the Bhutan private sector uh, faces today. And when it comes to the benefits of, you know, uh, being a member of the WTO, accession to WTO, I think uh, it's pretty much clear. I think Bhutan would uh, pretty much benefit just like any other country would have benefited. And uh, the benefits of being a part of the WTO is evident from you now the so many countries having access, uh, access to WTO. So that said, uh, I, I thought I would first of all share why these uh, debates has been going, the debate has been going on for so long in Bhutan of whether Bhutan should you know, accede to WTO or not. Now, when I say that, I would like to highlight some of the uh, views that have been expressed against uh, joining the WTO. It doesn't mean that uh, Bhutan is opposed to uh, joining WTO. But I thought that, you know, if I spend my time on highlighting some of the views that had actually, you know, stopped Bhutan from being a part of WTO, I thought uh, I could get some wisdom from all the panelists here today as to whether these, uh, some of the issues that I express here are some issues that can, that, you know, that, that could be overcome, that we can overcome, or, you know, uh, it is really uh, an issue for Bhutan being, you know, being Bhutan, right? So I thought I would start off by, uh, you know, uh, highlighting some of these. Now, the main reason why uh, in Bhutan the debate has been going on for so long and why some uh, people, whether it's from the public sector or from the private sector, has expressed some views against joining WTO is, not, uh, is based on some of the empirical evidences and the reports that have come out after you know, uh, so many countries have uh, access to WTO. There has been so many empirical evidences that have you know, uh, been suggesting that some members of the WTO have been benefiting more than the others. And on top of that, it, 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 it has been highlighted that small countries like, like Bhutan, as you know, I'm sure everyone knows the size of Bhutan, you know, where we are located. I'm sure I don't need to uh, spend time on that. Bhutan being a very small country, it's, uh, the reports have suggested that small countries could face difficulties in meeting the cost of WTO, you know, uh, complying with WTO rules, regulations in addition to loss of uh, policy autonomy because of uh, because uh, policies have to be aligned to the WTO if uh, a country uh, was to become a part of WTO, right? So because of these, these are some of the reasons that people from both public as well as the private sector have expressed. Now, Bhutan being a developing country, uh, in addition to its small size, we also have very limited technical and uh, professional capability today in the country. So because of which it is felt that uh, you might again face challenge in assessing the long-term consequences of the country's accession. You know, uh, it, 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 it could have an adverse implication in the future. It is felt that way. 
and uh, most expresses that Bhutan should first assess the availability and afford affordability of knowledge, knowledgeable lawyers and uh, people to deal with international law, experts and specialists to deal with science and technology that's associated with WTO. It is also felt that Bhutan may face a tremendous strain in meeting the implementation challenges uh, due to financial, technological, and human resource limitations that we have today as a developing country. Although, you know, there are flexibilities, you know, in implementations of the WTO agreements that's been provided, such as phase implementation system and a longer time period for implementation for the LDCs, things like that, it still may be very difficult for a country like Bhutan to establish institutions and infrastructures that are required you know, uh, in becoming a part of WTO. And also uh, in terms of economic uh, dependency, since there's also evidence indicating that there is increasing inequalities in developing countries, especially in developing and small countries, especially uh, after their accession to the WTO. So the reports have you know, uh, suggested, uh, I mean, it has been reported that almost 90% of urban households actually benefit uh, or gain from the WTO accession, you know, uh, while about three quarters of the rural uh, households actually lose out. So these are based on the reports and because of these people have started to express reservations. As a result, it is felt that Bhutan's accession to WTO may increase regional inequalities as the accession to the WTO will only benefit uh, those industrialists and uh, you know, uh, urban households. Further, the, uh, they also, this reservation expressed in terms of the uh, production technology and mass commercial production of agriculture products combined with heavy subsidies in the developed countries, all which would help to keep prices low on the international market. So therefore, it would negatively impact on the ex existing unfavorable balance of payments that uh, we as a country have today through two channels, by reduction of exports and also uh, through increasing exports. One of the studies have explicitly uh, mentioned that Taiwan actually recorded an increase in both net import val uh, volume and value in the year after its accession to the WTO. So this is essentially due to the challenge of you know, selling dom domestic products on the international market due to steep competition. So there is this danger that increased dependency on you know, imported goods could put a country like Bhutan at risk. For example, uh, a few years ago, uh, there's also been a report which said that the ban on export of a certain kind of rice by the Indian government uh, created a famine in Bangladesh actually. You know? so, Although the ban was lifted uh, after so many protests by the Bangladesh people, they had to bear a price increase for by about 60%. So these kind of dangers uh, people see could actually you know, uh, adversely affect uh, a country like Bhutan by joining the WTO at this point in time. The offer of services under the WTO agreements also uh, is said to attract uh, foreign direct investment from multinational companies around the you know, uh, member countries. And this is likely to boost the economic development in the short run, which is, of course, good. However, the economic development will not necessarily uh, guarantee the welfare if the benefits of such development uh, fail to distribute equitably you know, uh, within the country. So these are some of the you know, uh, reservations that people have expressed during these debates based on the you know, uh, empirical evidence that have been put out there through you know, various reports. Now, uh, given the time limit, I, I uh, briefly talk about the challenges that uh, the Bhutan private sector uh, faces today. The private sector in Bhutan, just like its country, is very much at a, a nascent stage today. In fact, uh, you know, in, in reports published by you know the World Bank and all that, the underdevelopment, uh, underdeveloped private sector has been used as a you know characteristics to describe Bhutan even. So you know uh, this this indicates you know uh, the the situation that the private sector of Bhutan is in today. And uh, 
in the World Bank report, it has also been described that the you know the private sector of Bhutan is constrained due to uh, demand and supply factors. So uh, this basically uh, attributes to you know uh, shortages of skills in in the private sector, small size of domestic market, along with limited access to foreign markets, lack of competition, access to finance. All these have been you know. Uh, described as constraining factor to this uh, underdeveloped private sector of Bhutan. And uh, if I may, as the, you know, uh, someone who works in the Chamber of Commerce and uh, who works closely with the private sector of Bhutan and uh, not basing on any uh, kind of facts or figures, but based on the sheer experience, you know, uh, the ground realities, if, if I may share a little bit of that, uh, the reports that the World Bank and our published are ex are absolutely true. Actually, today the private sector of Bhutan, uh, if you look, if 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 I, if I were to describe the private sector, it, it a small thing like uh, the efforts to promote the private sector by the public sector by the government. Actually, efforts are there, but the real-time scenario is that the efforts are too fragmented and you know it converges at no point in time so the impact created actually created in the private sector is very minimal against what is actually intended so there's a lot that uh, because we're talking about public private sector dialogue there's a lot that uh, the, the the private and the private sector need to sit down and then uh, discuss about how the private sector can actually be you know uh, brought into the uh, as as a as an important stakeholder in the, uh, the development process. So there's a lot that needs to be done, and one of the reasons that the private sector of Bhutan is also is still in a very underdeveloped stage is because of the presence of the state dominance, presence of the state uh, competing with the private sector actually. Today we have about, uh, for instance, we have the state operating enterprises in almost every sector, be it manufacturing, be it energy, be it natural resources, in the financial sector, communication, aviation, trading, you name it, you know, there is great uh, enterprises in almost all these sectors. And what's happening is that because of the presence of the uh, state-owned enterprises, the private sector is actually getting a little crowded out. So there is this debate also going on as to you know how these uh, state-owned enterprises should operate within the country uh, by not actually you know crowding out the private sector. So there, there is this debate also uh, going on. And okay, could you please unmute yourself? Okay. Actually, the uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, actually, the introduction of state-owned enterprises to actually carry out uh, the kind of work that the private sector is doing is not with the intention to crowd out the private sector, but with the intention to help the private sector. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the actual operation in the ground is not happening as per the objective of uh, the state-owned enterprise actually being uh, introduced. So therefore, the most of the private sector today are not happy with the presence of the state-owned enterprises. And uh, like I said, uh, they, they, there's this, as we speak about it, there's this huge debate uh, going on between the private and the public sector. Uh, just recently, the government also introduced that all the, for instance, just, just as an example, all the mining activities will be carried out by the state-owned enterprises. There's been uh, this introduction of a bill, you know, like that. And uh, as we speak about it, the private sector is very unhappy about it. Okay. So these kind of, these are the, some, you know, uh, constraints that is actually, factors that is actually constrain the growth of the private sector. And also Bhutan, because of the, because of its location and because of its hilly terrain, the mountainous terrain and all that, we have very limited access to market. We have uh, immediate uh, neighbors with China in the north and with uh, India in the south, along the south. Uh, 
so most of our trade most of our market is only you know uh, india and uh, bangladesh to some extent and also today if you talk about the private sector we have 90% of the private 90% of the private sector is dominated by the service sector and when i say service sector it constitutes of you know uh, all the uh, trading the shops uh, the budget hotels all these small small things so mm-hmm. the production and manufacturing sector in the private sector constitutes of less than 10% today while describing the state of the private sector in in, in the country perhaps uh, everybody feels that uh, we are not at that stage where we can actually be a part of wto and you know uh, be able to compete with the developed countries that already uh, become a part of wto but like i said we are not opposed to the idea of uh, joining the wto it it is only felt that perhaps it is a little bit too early as of now and uh, certain efforts are already being geared towards uh, developing the private sector and you know uh, at a later time if i if i have some time i i can share that with you some some uh, interventions that have been taken by the government in order to you know uh, develop the private sector All right. so thank you very much thank you very much mr sange um okay. for highlighting the uh, the challenges with the private sector especially in the developing countries um including technical and professional capability challenges competitiveness this is these are actually topics that we will talk about today and with that i would like to move on to mr anthony haga um right now is a very momentous time for sudan as the world knows the transitional government is currently exploring means of building a stronger and a more reformed economy and you will agree with me that it is also interesting that why sudan is negotiating its accession to the WTO it's also a signatory to the AFCFTA which is the African Continental Free Trade Area now both processes promise far reaching domestic reforms and you know a continent that is more integrated with itself as regards the WTO a wider multilateral trading reach but you would agree with me that, that to achieve this a right environment has to be achieved now from your perspectives what are the private sector expectations from becoming a member of the WTO and as they negotiate in parallel these two agreements what should be the priorities that they should push for both in the multilateral trading system and in the regional integration but mr anthony you have the floor please kindly unmute yeah thank you uh, ms onibuchi and uh, also with the thanks to the teams at wto and itc for arranging this uh, webinar i'm i'm going to concentrate uh, my comments on the experiences from a private sector perspective before the change because i think the transitional government is still very new and early and as some of you may be following um, top of the list at the moment is an ongoing uh, discussion with the imf around the reform package and how we move forward um but in short the sudanese uh, experience has not been effective uh, or meaningful in the past um, the previous the business federation in its previous uh, format was supposedly meant to be the platform that represented the uh, broader private sector and unfortunately it was very politicized and served very narrow interests that coupled with the experience in the mid 90s when we became an oil exporting country and our borders uh, started opening up as we began the journey with the uh, negotiations with wto um in from a private sector perspective the reality was very quickly we had cheaper products from asia and we quickly found we were unable as private sector to export competitively or to compete domestically with the influx of cheaper products and so as a result private sector today the wta the wto in the in the lens or through the prism of private sector is seen largely negatively it has a, it has a legacy stigma that is very negative and and that the root cause is experiences as a result of disadvantage disadvantage in terms of cost economies of scale and relative inefficiencies disadvantages in terms of technology and r&d and um as i said colored by by the experiences of of people in their in their day to day the other the other thing that is uh, a a problem uh, i think from drawing from the past is that uh, the sponsor has always been the ministry of in- industry and trade and that in itself is not the problem but the, the the capacity and the competency needs to be um developed much more broadly rather than being uh, 
uh, concentrated. Um, Ministry of Industry and Trade is the is the the the, the likely interlocutor or champion, but it has the, the skill set and the, and the knowledge bank has to has to be broader than than just that. Otherwise, we end up with what happened, which was small islands of pockets of capacity and, and knowledge concentrated in individuals um, and not effectively cascaded. Um, traditionally, unfortunately, also the, the, the focus was on quick wins um, rather than that they tended to be very shallow and, and designed for, for public uh, uh, consumption or, or, or to, to sort of earn uh, brownie points rather than looking at the the deep-rooted um, uh, changes that were required to make a sustainable uh, progress. So in, in the first instance, um, there's much needed work in re-educating private sector and other, sec uh, and other key st stakeholders about the merits of uh, WTO and other general uh, trade agreements. You need to start uh, by winning the hearts and building uh, broader knowledge. Um, and then also part and parcel of that is the execution capacity in terms of Priorities, uh, you know, I think we are predominantly an, uh, an agricultural, uh, uh, we should be a predominantly agricultural uh, economy. And there, there's huge potential to develop the value chain from just being primary export to the full, developing the full uh, uh, value chain. And then other, other key pillars of development and, and, um, and prosperity are also ICT and energy. And these are areas where also uh, I, would, I would suggest as a, as a, as a government in a country that we... Um, we prioritize energy because it's it it's the the, the fuel, if you like, to, to drive growth, and ICT because in an increasingly connected world, um, you need to be able to connect and communicate and engage um, more more remotely and, and more efficiently, more cost effectively. In terms of good practice, um, I think uh, what uh, and I'm not an expert, but I mean for me, it, it, the Securing political will is critical. Uh, identifying a competent and experienced uh, national negotiator um, that has depth and breadth um, in multilateral systems and also within and across the country and the region. And then putting together a, a working group that spans all the key stakeholders and making sure that uh, that's a process that's both empowered um, uh, and representative. And I think in, in the Sudan context, the first priority would be um, for this team led by the national negotiator to identify the, the merits and concerns of WTO ascension in the Sudanese context, perceived and real, and then communicate to address these so you secure a broader buy-in uh, uh, to buttress the, the political will. Um, and then I think you need to, we need to identify the, execu the execution limitations that are critical and the critical success factors and put into place the capacities and the competencies to allow um, the ascension process to set up for success. And then I think then we're in a position where we can start negotiations and, and realistically agree and sign off an ascension plan that would be good for, for, for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insight, Mr. Anthony. I'm, 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 I'm glad that a theme which has run in the first two interventions is actually export competitiveness, enhancing you know, trade um, competitiveness of countries and also enhancing how both the government and the private sector communicates to achieve the common goals and which is great because our next speaker is from a country which has already acceded to the WTO and perhaps we can learn we can learn something from that. Um, in that vein I'll be directing my next question to Mr. Igor. Now Russia became the 156th country that joined the WTO after 18 long years of negotiation. Russia's accession is so important that it has been it has become a point of reference for both accessions in the European um, region and also by extension Eurasia due to its geographical location and market size. Earlier this week, we learned from chief negotiators that accession in itself is not necessarily the end, but it's a means to an end, which means that a lot of the work will come after the countries join the WTO. In that vein, I would like to ask you, Using lessons from Russia's post-accession, how can the private sector partner with the government to continue to promote the interests of you know, private entities after becoming a member of the WTO? Thank you very much for uh, the introduction. A very warm welcome. Uh, thank you for the organizers. And uh, I really enjoyed listening to the previous speakers, uh, listening to their challenges that they're fighting in their in their native uh, countries um, i remember these times when russia was uh, 
I think it was 18 years that Russia was negotiate, negotiating WTO membership. And uh, uh, I was witnessing the last years of these negotiations beginning since 2006 for about five, six years. And I know that private sector, including big companies, which are kind of concerned for Bhutan, uh, they made lots of contribution and lots of push uh, for Russia to actually understand all the benefits and uh, eventually uh, go and join the WTO. So um, I'll be speaking from a very different perspective today than, uh, than my previous speaker, our previous speakers, and uh, we'll give a, a view, a private perspective of how we see this uh, working now in Russia. So just a few words about my company. Uh, we're a very big company itself. Uh, we're a global producer of nitrogen phosphate and uh, potash fertilizers. Uh, we're now actually headquartered in Switzerland, uh, but the group operates uh, production facilities around the world. And uh, lots of production footprint we have in Russia, as well as in Europe, in Asia, CIS countries. And uh, we currently employ more than 26,000 people. So uh, that said, having substantial fertilizer production operations in Russia, Eurocam and actually our Russian peers, we have historically, and in some cases since uh, Soviet times, faced restrictive trade measures, uh, mostly anti-dumping duties on our key fertilizer, in our key fertilizer consumption regions such as European Union, USA, Brazil, India, and uh, some other countries as well. So at the same time, significant part of our Russian fertilizer output actually finds our consumers outside of Russia. Uh, and it was really crucial to maintain existing and access new markets by easing and uh, removing trade restrictions for our industry. So uh, accession of the Russian Federation to the WTO actually really allowed Russian companies to become part of the uh, global business community, if I can put it this way, and uh, to raise the process of international socialization of Russian producers and exporters to a fundamentally different and uh, really higher level. It is well known, and it was noted today as well, that uh, apart from benefiting from international trade rules, um, states and actually com companies, private companies benefit from access to WTO dispute resolution body. Uh, and we have therefore uh, made a full use of the dispute settlement system of the WTO. And I would like to give you just a few examples today how uh, my industry specifically benefited from Russia's accession to the WTO, an example specifically of a dispute settlement body and cases we launched there. So one of the first uh, most pr prominent examples which I would like to give is a WTO challenge uh, to the of the use energy adjustment practice, uh, which is referred as case DS-494. Uh, EU, European Union, uh, imposed actually several anti-dumping duties on the imports of uh, our nitrogen fertilizers from Russia. Um, and to impose duties, European Union used a so-called energy adjustment methodology. In our case, it was a natural gas cost adjustment. Uh, whereas European Union, European Commission calculates the cost of production in Russia using um, price of natural gas in Germany and rejecting our actual domestic price of natural gas in Russia. Well, in fact, this practice uh, significantly uh, uh, irritates, uh, you know, bilateral climate between EU and Russia and its relations. And uh, soon after Russia's jo Russia joined the WTO in August 2012, and upon request by Eurocam, by my company, Russian government brought a WTO challenge uh, to the EU practice and uh, challenging anti-dumping measure in particular. So as we speak, uh, WTO is working to produce a final report of the panel 
which is uh, going to be out quite shortly as soon as July of this year. And we are quite hopeful that successful outcome, and we have reasons to believe that it may be so, uh, would result in seizing risk of imposition of anti-dumping duties on uh, Russian fertilizer imports in the future. Uh, then the second example I would like to give you concerns WTO challenge uh, to Ukraine's anti-dumping measure on another nitrogen fertilizer called ammonium nitrate, and the case is uh, number DS-493. So back in 2015, Russia challenged at the WTO Ukraine's measure on ammonium nitrate, which was at that time 11%, which also applied to Eurocam. And we also challenged there the legality of energy adjustment methodology, which was used by Ukraine and actually copied from the established European Union practice. Uh, the appellate body there, which upheld the panel's finding, uh, sustained Russia's claims, meaning that Eurocam uh, is now exempted from the application of these anti-dumping duties. So we, we won the case. And uh, the successful outcome of this case uh, will, will most likely and hopefully set the positive track for any future procedures against Russian fertilizer imports. And uh, last but not least, uh, but very interesting and useful example uh, from, from our experience, which I would like to give is that the benefit to, to our industry um, which we obtained with Russia's accession to the WTO was also liberalization of Russia's export practices. Um, before 2012, our industry and some other major exporting industries in Russia, they were subject to export tariffs, which needless to say, were very harmful to our industry. Uh, so I mentioned earlier and uh, that's how we protected our right was, rights, was that in the WTO accession protocol, Russia committed to an obligation to fix export duties for the fertilizer industry at 0%. It was done after a certain transitional period and the uh, benefits from that were many. It, it really gave predictability and stability to our operations it increased private sector competitiveness. It was not just the fertilizer industry, other sectors were covered as well. It really resulted in our ability to set lower export prices and therefore be more competitive in foreign markets. And uh, really the growth of sales revenues and uh, therefore taxes uh, was pretty, was obvious, so Russia as a country uh, was also also a beneficiary to this process. So uh, that's my contribution to answering your question, uh, which I think is more on the positive side uh, rather than negative. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Igor, for that um, contribution. Now, I'm, it's great that you mentioned one of the unique um, characteristics of the WTO, which is that not only to negotiate agreements, but it also has the facilities to implement or enforce, you know, that countries who agree to these um, instruments actually implement them. And um, I'm, I, will, I will follow up with you with another question based on the positive um, experiences which you have given us, is that how for the, for the benefit of private sectors in other accident countries or acceded countries, how did your company work with the government? Because our topic today is public-private dialogue. So how did they work with the government to be able to bring the case before the WTO dispute system so that other private sector can learn how to use this tool which is available to them after accessions? So you, you can uh, make a two-minute intervention. Indeed, um, one of the side benefits from uh, Russia's accession to WTO was uh, our ability or ability of the companies. Uh, well, first of, first of all, those which were willing to invest intellectual resources uh, to establish and uh, maintain a permanent dialogue with the Russian government on WTO issues. And uh, in case of Russia, it was the Ministry of Economic Development of the Russian Federation. Um, 
such dialogue really uh, requires companies to invest in building an in-house trade law and trade policy expertise. I, I, won't, uh, I won't lie. But at the same time, it creates an opportunity to develop and substantiate initiatives uh, which can subsequently be taken to the WTO display, WTO DSB, for example, or actually discussed at uh, WTO platforms uh, such as committees and councils. Um, in certain cases, uh, of course, um, it requires um, it requires consolidation of positions of various companies. You know, it's hard to deal without that because cases, uh, there may be a conflict between the interests of different companies. There, also ex there were also examples of conflicts between the uh, immediate interest of private companies and systematic interest of the government on certain trade policy matters. So uh, addressing all these issues uh, really requires ability to compromise uh, and we have gained that experience working uh, with state stakeholders. The result of this dialogue, though, is that the voice uh, of Russian producers and exporters will be heard at the global level. And maybe just to add and conclude that uh, that input is that obviously many countries, uh, including current WTO members, are questioning benefits from uh, their WTO membership. This is indeed maybe due to a rise in populism in a way, but also uh, it could be that um, there, in, there is a need to negotiate certain changes, which is proposed by, by, by some members. What is certain uh, to myself and to, to my company is that WTO remains the only international organization providing a set of uh, rules for international commerce and a place where members can try and actually sort out their trade problems. So in my view, the system must maintain. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's great that you, despite the challenges you had, you um, highlighted also the, the benefits of being in the multilateral trading system. Um, with that, on that note, I would like to go to my colleague, Ms. Daria Shabalina from the ITC. She's a trade policy expert and she has been working with governments, both the public sector and the private sector to enhance that constructive national dialogue, which we've been talking about today, concerning trade policy reforms, strengthening their SMEs, integrating gender perspectives as countries continue to take trade measures, and also facilitating developing countries' accession to the WTO. Now, Ms. Daria, I would like to also add, before I ask the question, because many of the countries um, now acceding to the WTO are in regions where small and medium enterprises play a huge role in the economy. With that, I would like to ask Ms. Daria, based on your work at the ITC Trade Facilitation and Policy for Business team, what best practices have emerged from ITC's work and how can the private sector who are listening in all around the world use these and WTO accessions effectively to enhance their own trade competitiveness and how resilient their SMEs are? Ms. Daria, you have the floor. Thank you, Chidima. Well, I would like to thank uh, the WTO Secretariat and Accession Division for organizing this event and continuing our discussion today and coming to my question. I would like to take this opportunity and to share with you some lessons and observations that uh, ITC learned uh, through a decade of uh, assistance uh, with uh, uh, developing the countries uh, who are exceeding uh, to the WTO. So, exceeding governments uh, that uh, have used the WTO membership to integrate successfully in the global economy, they conducted negotiations based on the economic development objectives. And at the same time, the private sector was also ready for the reform. So, uh, how uh, do these governments achieve this? Um, there are actually uh, three main aspects uh, that uh, I would like uh, to talk about. The first one, uh, it uh, refers uh, to uh, that the governments uh, of exceeding members, they established uh, the country's objectives based on the assessment of uh, private sector competitiveness. 
and at the same time, the private sector was uh, also well aware about the WTO business um, uh, business implications, and it was uh, prepared to benefit from the new market opportunities as well as to cope with uh, any challenges. Uh, the second aspect is uh, that uh, the governments uh, of succeeding members negotiated a uh, policy in a way uh, that to caution uh, the flow of uh, import competition, especially in uh, those uh, sectors uh, that are uh, labor intense and sensitive. And the third aspect that is uh, worth to be mentioning is that the government built uh, the political and economic case for reforms uh, and at the same time ensured coherence between existing regional and uh, emerging uh, new uh, multilateral obligations. In this context, the private sector's uh, main objectives uh, within the accession process were the following. Uh, the first uh, and the foremost is uh, that an increase and in well predicted uh, market access opportunities. And the second one is uh, that um, business would lobby uh, the interest uh, for um, almost no, or if uh, uh, if small, uh, the smallest possible extent uh, of impact competition. However, uh, in this uh, regard, uh, it was uh, also uh, important to balance it uh, against the lower prices of uh, imported inputs and services due to increased uh, competition, uh, which is uh, an essential ingredient for the overall competitiveness of domestic manufacturing. What is also uh, very important to uh, bear in mind uh, that in all countries, the private sector is consisted uh, of uh, a heterogeneous aggregate of uh, often uh, very opposite interests. So the governments of uh, negotiating countries they should be well advised and carefully analyze these needs and to calibrate the negotiating um, policies accordingly. It is also uh, very crucial uh, to ensure that private sector is involved in this process and it's representative of the national economy. Uh, and that, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, small and medium enterprises uh, are involved and women in business as well, and they re represent uh, almost 95% uh, of um, economic actors in the country. Uh, what is uh, also needed to be done is uh, that exceeding uh, governments, uh, they need to address uh, the potential business misconceptions that can be uh, connected uh, with the WTO accession process. Uh, such uh, misconceptions may be as follows. Uh, as fears of importers or uh, being displaced by foreign competitors in all sectors or being denied of any government benefits. However, uh, a properly harnessed uh, accession process gives governments necessary time to assuage these fears and also uh, allow time for the private sector to undertake the needed adjustments. And coming on the uh, question um, regarding ensuring coherence between existing regional and emerging multilateral commitments, uh, I would like to provide uh, one uh, specific example that was uh, um, witnessed uh, by the ITC. Uh, it is uh, about Liberia. Uh, ITC uh, supported Liberia to develop a national trade policy that uh, fostered coherence between its uh, domestic, industrial and investment policies and uh, its evolving WTO accession obligations and commitments uh, that uh, Liberia made with ECOWAS. So through this national trade policy, Liberia was able to align the necessary legislative and policy reforms and avoid inconsistencies between its long-standing ECOWAS commitments and its emerging new WTO obligations.
Chidinwa, I think you don't hear mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Daria. For, and it's, it's nice to know that there are these technical and capacity building um, activities available to governments who are trying to accede to the WTO. Um, as a follow-up question to that, I would, one thing that I think follows from your intervention is that like a, a recent World Economic Forum um, publication said, it says that you know, in certain regions, SMEs could limit the aftermath of you know, economic fallout. Right now, the world is dealing with COVID-19, which is a pandemic which, has, which is unprecedented. No one really expected you know, the fallout of the, the economic fallout that will follow after it. A lot of people say it's not going to be business as usual, while a lot of people say, well, the world will adapt and, you know, keep moving on. But now I want to ask you specifically, just like you gave specific examples, what practices have emerged in your work that you think could be emulated by the private sector after the post-pandemic, which can limit the fallout, um, the, the economic fallout, which was caused by the pandemic? And what role should public-private dialogue play in it? What examples have you had throughout the trajectory of your work? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chilino. Uh, well, actually, all uh, the observations and lessons uh, that uh, I have mentioned before, they, of course, uh, are applicable uh, to uh, nowadays uh, situation. Um, as a highlight uh, regarding to the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, how now uh, the SMEs uh, and all economic operators uh, um, have uh, to cope with. Uh, I would like to uh, give some highlights on that. Uh, so uh, during COVID-19 uh, lockdown, uh, we of course uh, seen uh, that uh, countries now accelerating uh, in uh, their transition to the dig digital economy. So uh, we see many examples like e-commerce or digitalization of customs approval procedures or risk management techniques or if we take uh, SPS side it is uh, ensuring food safety uh, standards and um, occupational health standards and for example e-documentation on the TBT SPS certificates so uh, uh, there are many many examples and uh, those of these uh, trends they were highlighted uh, during the pandemic of course uh, we have uh, them today and of course they will remain in the future and uh, these trends they are very important for uh, fostering business competitiveness and uh, that it is going forward and uh, of course accepting governments uh, they should be well advised about these trends and uh, should uh, accommodate uh, them in uh, the negotiating policies and um, also um, negotiating uh, committee negotiating commitments uh, to the WTO, uh, they also uh, should uh, take uh, these trends uh, into account. So in this respect, uh, the uh, private uh, public dialogue should have a critical uh, role and to ensure that uh, the needs and interests of the private sectors are well accounted for in the government policies. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, indeed, it is important to know why, you know, a country should be part of the multilateral trading system. But it is another thing to communicate, you know, take these messages to the government. And I would like to come back to Mr. Sange. Um, looking at the Bhutan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we understand that you, you've been hosting, you know, um, public-private dialogue. Earlier um, this year, there was goods and service tax, public-private dialogue, and even recently in combating the impact of the pandemic. So now what I want to ask you is, based on your experience in these, in both the private sector and the governance sector, what things have you noticed that actually ensure that the message goes from the private sector to the government as they negotiate their accessions? So what are the best practices you've noticed in ensuring effective dialogue between state authorities and the business community. So you can give us a two minute intervention. Mr. Sange, please unmute yourself. Thank you. All right, sorry. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'd also like to thank all the speakers. It's been really thought provoking, I must say. Well, uh, to answer your question directly, I think, uh, 
myself as a representative of the Bhutan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, now trying to facilitate dialogues between the government and the private sector is one of our core mandates. We are, are the umbrella organization for the private sector and it is our uh, duty to bridge this gap if there is any between the government and the private sector. Now, uh, holding a discussion on the you know, goods and service tax that you mentioned is one of many things that you know we've been carrying out uh, you know uh, like like i said it is one of our primary mandates so i do not uh, think that i i don't know in terms of best practices if i were to uh, give an example of what we ourselves as the chamber of commerce for bhutan private sector has done is that in addition to holding these kind of dialogues between the uh, government and the private sector. We have also instituted within the chamber what we call the private sector development committee. So this committee comprises of the members from the government as well as from the private sector. And it is housed within the Bhutan Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Now, uh, what this committee does is not to uh, actually look at specific uh, you know, issues that come out of various different sectors from the private sector, but this is to actually uh, we are looking holistically as to how the private sector can be uh, actually mainstreamed as one of the core stakeholders uh, in the nation building process. So we are looking not just at, uh, like I said, not to specific uh, issues, but we are looking at the private sector, you know, uh, in general, and we express uh, views and inputs as to how various uh, gaps within the private sector can be actually uh, you know uh, filled and if there are actually uh, any differences in understanding certain things between the government and the private sector these are you know some issues that we actually discuss and we put recommendations to the government from the private sector and we also discuss with various sector in the private sector, take their perspective. And uh, of course, this is not to, you know, we ensure that we don't actually behave like a post office, but we actually analyze with un after understanding the perspective of the private sector and also the perspective of the government. And then we come up with, you know, a, a middle part, if you will, and then, uh, you know, propose certain recommendations to the government as to how things can be improved. Okay. If, I, uh, if that answers your question. Yes. Thank you very much for that. Um, now we will, um, I will take one question from the floor and this is directed to Mr. Anthony Hagar. It's Ms. Bemisola Osadua from University College London and she's asking, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and similar times of crisis, what is your predisposition as a private entity to hearing of, um, alternative dispute settlements in multilateral and regional trade agreements? I guess this relates to the fact that you know now we're using different tools in enforcing or enhancing commitments. So, Mr. Hagar, you have the floor. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, the the world has changed, and and business as usual, no doubt, has been challenged. Um, I, I believe that this should be seen as an opportunity rather than as a hindrance, and the focus should be on using tools and means that allow work uh, to flow in a manner that is uh, efficient, uh, effective, and in keeping with due process. So in as long as, or in as much as you can achieve that through remote virtual hearing, which I believe uh, communications and, and digital uh, tools allow that, um, I, I see it, I don't see it as a, as a problem. I don't have a mental block, I, the, the opposite. I think it will help streamline and make these things, uh, has the potential to make them a lot more effective. More, and a lot more efficient. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I will pose the next question to Mr. Igor. Um, it's uh, um, a participant asking, in your experience, do you think that governments and countries will be open to a virtual hearing dispute settlement mechanisms under the WTO in times of crisis? I guess this follows from, you know, your experience with the um, res resolving of the European anti-dumping duties. So do you think that right now, the way the world is, will government, countries, private entities be open to dispute settlement mechanisms virtually? Well, 
It's difficult, <laughs> difficult to answer this question. Uh, I don't think we have had this experience yet. Um, but we are in, uh, as we speak, we're in many procedures, uh, anti-dumping reviews and investigations uh, on other platforms uh, and regions such as European Union, uh, Russia, and uh, recently, as recent as several days in, in the United States. And um, I believe that, uh, I, I, I see that the, with these authorities and with these national authorities, many processes uh, have already found a um, way to go online. Yeah, so uh, we conduct verifications with officials online, verifying financial information, uh, plants, data, materials, etc. It's all being done virtually through video conferences. Uh, that said, you know, applying that on the uh, WTO uh, platform and mechanism, I, I think it, it would pretty much be possible in my view. I don't see anything wrong about that. Thank you for your perspective. I would like to um, take this opportunity to thank all our participants for, for tuning in both today and from the beginning of the webinar series. It has indeed been a thought-provoking um, time of sharing experiences between accident government, private sector, chief negotiators. And so um, I would like to remind everyone that the recording of all um, webinars will be available at a certain time and date, which will be communicated to you. And in closing, I would like to invite Mr. Rajesh Agarwal, who is the Chief of the Trade Facilitation and Policy for Business Team in the International Trade Center, and who has been very instrumental to the organization of this seminar. Thank you, Mr. Rajesh. I will invite him to give a commentary on the session and also to give his closing remarks. It has been a productive discussion, and I thank all panelists and all participants. Mr. Agarwal, you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sudhima. <clears throat> Before I, you know, venture into giving my closing remarks, since there is time, I thought that let me also contribute to answering this question, whether, you know, on the alternatives to the dispute settlement mechanism during the COVID era, uh, if I may just uh, share my view, you know, based on what many countries are seeing in their own judicial system. See, the superior courts, where generally it is the arguments on both sides given by the lawyers. I think that part of the judicial system is quite well functioning in all countries, especially the major ones that I read in the newspapers. But in the lower courts, for example, where the evidence has to be adduced, cross-examination of the witnesses has to be conducted and certain documents have to be produced on the spot, there I feel that you know the courts are closed in fact so in a way uh, what i'm trying to say is that the wgo dispute settlement process which is based on to the extent based on the arguments on both sides you know by the lawyers and for the panelists or the judges to judge based on those arguments i don't uh, think that there is any difference between the physical presence of those lawyers or the virtual presence of those lawyers making those arguments. But whereas, you know, in the lower court system where evidence has to be adduced, the witnesses have to be cross-examined, so on and so forth, shown some, you know, documents to verify, obviously there are certain constraints which are imposed due to non-physical presence of those people. Having said that, let me now come to, uh, you know, whatever role you, are, you have assigned me. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the distinguished speakers for contributing to a very rich discussion, which I feel, on the significance of public-private interaction, both during the process of accession and later exercising its rights as a WTO member. I think two things stand out quite clearly from this discussion. Today's discussion, I mean. First, we heard examples of successful use of the WTO dispute settlement system. It was coming from a big company's perspective, from Russia. And then we also heard that a country's bid for WTO membership can lead to a feeling of uncertainty in the private sector because 
of the long established methods of conducting businesses are susceptible to considerable change. It is the fear of unknown in a way, which has come out quite clearly. Now, ITC's analysis, again, based on our decade long experience of assisting countries exceeding to WTO, it clearly reveals that the governments which benefited from WTO membership had proactively invested in raising awareness and removing some of the misperceptions about the impact of WTO commitments on businesses. These countries also undertook necessary domestic policy and regulatory reforms during the period of negotiating their accession to WTO. Now, recognizing this reality, ITC's technical assistance activities these days are laying a lot of emphasis on building confidence in the private sector on new ways of doing business in the changed environment. Now, this is a, achieved by engaging businesses in consensus building in our technical assistance, for example, on preparing offers on goods and services, as well as legislative action plans. We build capacity of private sector along with government officials on various WTO agreements and go a step further and bring out the implications of WTO membership commitments on established business models. We take this opportunity to make the private sector aware of the business opportunities that will emerge in the new paradigm. Essentially, we drive down the point that those enterprises will benefit or are likely to benefit from WTO membership who succeed in fostering linkages with value chains of foreign investors, which in turn is made possible due to improvements in business and investment climate triggered by WTO commitments. I would like to emphasize the role of trade and investment to be taken together when we are discussing about the opportunities and challenges of WTO accession, because the WTO membership does provide predictability to a potential foreign investor. I am not at all trying to give the impression that WTO membership alone will help in attracting foreign investment. What I'm trying to say is that this is one of the, or the predictability provided by a country's taking commitments in WTO is a very important consideration for a foreign investor while making a decision for foreign investment. Now, having said that, in closing, I would like to thank you all once again for sharing your valuable experience with us today and wish you all a happy weekend. Enjoy. Thank you. Chidima, we don't hear you. We have come to the end of the accession week and once again, I would like to thank everyone for participating. I hope you have learned and I think Mr. Rajesh's um, commentary answers the question by Tian Hiri Zhang. And um, I wish you a wonderful weekend and look forward to conversing with you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.